You have it on? Yes, there we go. We have a few more folks still checking in, so I'm not going to get officially started until I see the, as I, I'll stick my head around the corner and see who's coming in. But in the meantime, I uh, just want to let you all know that for, I saw a few of you in here fairly early, there's a raffle going on uh, for a free LSAT course through the Department of Continuing Ed. So if you didn't sign up for that, uh, there'll be a break that you can go and fill out some forms to sign up for that free LSAT course. Um, in terms of the break, we'll go for about half an hour where I'm talking about some very basic things like the LSAT and the candidate assembly service reports. And then after the break, we'll get into the meat of the actual application and its file contents. Okay, I think we're good. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reyes Aguilar. I'm one of the associate deans here at the Quinney College of Law. Welcome to the law school. You're in a fairly new building. We love the fact that um, we just moved in here four years ago, and it's a great space that we're very happy to be in. For any of you who are University of Utah students and were involved with the Hinckley Institute or working with social and behavioral sciences in the building next door, that's where we used to be, and we were in that building for 50 years. So you know why we're so happy to be in our new building. Um, tonight's workshop is the application workshop. As I alluded to a few minutes ago, we're going to be covering everything from the very basic basics for a few minutes and on through the application, uh, its contents and the process, the evaluators, things like that. Hopefully you'll find all this information very helpful. Uh, but before we get started, I want to make uh, an introduction. Uh, Julie Nelson is uh, a test prep instructor for the University Department of Continuing Ed. Is it still under Department of Continuing Ed? And um, I'm going to give her a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about their test prep program, some information about that, and also um, answer any questions you may have either about the program or test prep generally. Julie. from six to nine for about four weeks. An exception, I'm, like I'm teaching the one to get you ready for the January test, but we're gonna push it all to before Christmas. So it starts around Thanksgiving, it ends around Christmas, and that gives you a month to study after that. Yes? Yeah. No, there's not a deadline. To, if you turn it off to apply, and like you don't have to be a current university, you don't have to be playing, 
to go to view for law school, anyone's welcome to take it. There's no deadline to register for it except the first day. Do you have um, practice tests yeah. administered in the class, or do you have the students kind of do that on their own? Okay, so the first night we'll do a diagnostic, which won't be a complete full length test. It kind of depends on whether it's a Saturday class or a Tuesday Thursday class. We do a diagnostic, and then we do one full length administered test the second to last class, and somebody comes and practices when they do a little And then we like establish times for you to do other. So those diagnostic tests will be the most recently released official LSAT tests. So you may be familiar with these books that have 10 tests in them, and then they also sell tests individually. And so we'll use whichever two are the two most recent as the diagnostic and the No, we got this down. Yeah. Oh. So they conclude the week prior to test? So it depends. The, they're always varying. So I think the one that starts on Saturday the 15th will finish like the week before the November test. So usually you start with the test date and we work backwards. And usually they end right before the test, except for the Christmas one that I explained. So I guess the only other thing is that that's what the drawing is for up front. One of you will get a free class if you want it. So make sure you put your name in the drawing and then they'll let you know this week after they've drawn it up. Okay? All right, good luck. Thank you, Julie. Uh, the, um, the second person I usually introduce is Amy Urbanic. She's the pre-law advisor for the University of Utah's uh, professional, pre-professional advising office. She got ill. So I just told her that I would introduce her in absentia. I uh, encourage you to go to the website if you're a University of Utah student in their pre-professional program. Uh, they are physically housed in University College, which is up by the Union Building, uh, close to the uh, Alumni House. Uh, that office will go over uh, your personal statements with you, do advising in terms of school selections. They have a whole host of services uh, that you should take advantage of. They also host the uh, annual law school fair where of the 202 ABA accredited law schools, usually about 100 to 110 will show up. They'll be in the union ballroom. Uh, I have the dates for that on a couple of slides. Uh, so they sponsor that one. I know the hours are from 10 to 2, and it's going to be, I think, the second to last week in October on a Tuesday. As I said, I'll, I'll have that up on some slides there. Um, the Y also hosts a law fair. It's the next day after that. So if ours is the, t the Tuesday of that week, then the Y will have one on uh, Wednesday, same hours. If you're a person who works during the day and you can't get out, traditionally uh, UVU has held a law fair in the evening on their campus, so that might be an option available to you to meet some representatives. Just know that because it's in the evening, and a lot of the reps are either staying here in Salt Lake uh, or moving on to the Arizona schools. Um, that evening program usually consists of primarily schools in the immediate region, maybe a few California schools. So, so instead of 100 schools, UVU usually attracts about 40 to 50 schools. Okay. All right, let's get started. Um, I like to have this be as hopefully informative as possible and somewhat informal. So don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions as we roll along. If it looks like we're going to start pushing that hour and a half, and I really do want to respect your time. Um, if it looks like we're pushing that hour and a half, I'll ask you to hold off your questions until I finish a section, and then we'll get to those. But until that happens, just feel free to ask away. I uh, do want to introduce you to the Office of Admissions. Uh, also, um, feel free to take photos with your iPhones, but I'm happy to send these slides out. So if we got your email address when you checked in, we'll send you a PDF of these slides so you don't have to take uh, copious notes as, and you can pay more attention just by listening. Um, my name is up there first. I lead the office. I will be out a good portion of this admission season. I'm going to be taking a sabbatical from November until the end of May. I'll be checking in regularly. But Isabel, our Moreno, our associate director, will become interim director of admissions. 
as I step on the cord, sorry, um, interim director of admissions while I am absent. Susan Baca is our admissions operator, uh, uh, operations manager. She's actually going to, be, going to be one person who you have a lot of contact with once you've submitted your application. She will be the one communicating with you and who you will reach out to if you have questions about whether your file has been completed or you're waiting to get some letters for, uh, from us. Um, things like that. She's also a whiz at ACES, so if you're having a problem filling out your application or navigating that software program uh, that you use to apply to law school, she can be really helpful. Our contact information there and uh, the general email admissions. If you email that, we also have a couple of law students who work as our ambassador fellows or their graduate assistants. Uh, and one of them was out there, Caitlin Assessi. You may uh, be reaching out or talking to one of them if you call on the general line or shoot the email. All right, so these are some of the events I alluded to. Um, first of all, I want to very much encourage you to come and sit in on a class and get a full tour of the law school. Uh, I think it's an immensely important part of this process. Um, Law school is going to be expensive, and uh, next week when we hold the financial aid information workshop, you'll, you'll find out how expensive it can be. But not only can law school be expensive, but simply the application process can be too. I think when you're considering the full cost of law school, um, you need to look at it from a five-year plan. The cost of applying to law school, the three years that you're in law school, and then the year after graduation. For any of you want, who want to work in the public sector, U.S. Attorney, Attorney General, Public Defender, uh, Nonprofit uh, Attorney for an agency like Utah Legal Services or the Legal Aid Society. It's important for you to know that you can't work for places like that until you're sworn in as an attorney. And you're not sworn in as an attorney until you pass the bar. You don't sit for the bar until July after you graduate in May. In Utah, it's a jurisdiction that's fairly quick at swearing in its attorneys. People who pass the bar are usually sworn in the first week of October. But in jurisdictions like New York or California, since so many people sit for the bar, first, they don't do the character and fitness check on those folks until they know who's passed it because they don't want to waste their time. People are informed of who passes the bar in November, and then it takes an additional two months for that evaluation on your character and fitness. So their swearing-in ceremonies aren't until January. So you need to have a financial plan to get you through that, and that's what that session is about. Um, I mentioned law, visiting law schools as an important part of that because what you'll discover is paying for law school under that five-year plan is like making an investment in something like a home. And doing a law school visit is like doing the, like the walkthrough for a house that you're thinking about borrowing. If you're going to be paying you know, $200,000, $300,000 for a house, you're not just going to buy it based on a couple of letters you get and a website and a bulletin piece, right? You're going to go walk through it, sit in on class. So that's something you should plan as part of the next year to year and a half that you're looking at applying to law schools, is visiting schools to get a sense of what they're really like what the students are like, what the faculty are like, and what you're going to be exposed to for the next three years. Because I think there's a lot of intangibles associated with attending law school that you can't get a sense of until you're sitting in on a class. I encourage you to look at both BYU and us as a place to visit, because even if you aren't interested in applying to a particular law school, if you have access to one that's close by, it's beneficial to sit in on a class and get a tour so that when you're applying to other schools, and if you can't do a tour as part of the application process uh, and you're considering whether you want to wait until you hear whether or not you've admitted, been admitted, you can at least ask questions with some context of a classroom visit in mind. How are people sitting? What's the vibe of the school in terms of its, uh, you know, the, the political tendencies of faculty or students? Um, simply, you know, what are the shapes of the classroom? Sometimes that matters to people. So visits are very important. Starting next week, we'll have our visits for fall open up. And on our website, you'll be able to see, uh, I'll show you where you, you look up and register for those. Uh, our application workshop is obviously what you're at today. And then next Tuesday for the same, same time slot will be our financial aid workshop. And I'll be covering what I mentioned already. The law school fair here at the U is October 23rd, uh, 10, to 20, uh, 10 to 2 p.m. And then the evening of the 23rd is traditionally UVU's. I have it in italics because I haven't heard from them yet, so I don't know if it's a go yet. But then definitely BYU's Law Fair is the next day on the 24th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m.
Uh, this is our website landing page. So to um, arrange for a visit, you go to the drop down is the second choice, right? And then once you click that, it'll open up and give you a schedule of classes and give you the instructions on how you, you RSVP for a visit and you can request a tour, things like that. Uh, there's also the events page. So if you're not going to be in town, but you travel a little bit and you're wondering what's going on in different places, you can see where we're having law fairs and some of the national events through the Law School Admission Council on our website. That's the events page. Okay. All right, so this is the real basic component of the discussion. Um, what is the basic requirement for being able to apply to law school? That is, you need to have a bachelor's conferred before you enroll. So a lot of the people don't have a bachelor's yet when they apply to law school. They apply during their senior year, which is fine. But just know that before you're allowed to start or officially matriculate into law school, you have to have your bachelor's degree posted to your transcript, your official transcript. So sometimes that's a challenge for people if they have to go to summer school all the way up to uh, the, the summer just before they intend to enroll in law school. And they have to make special arrangements. And it's not a big deal, but it puts a lot of pressure on you to make sure your credit ducks are in a row so that you really are graduating when you anticipate in the summer so that you're eligible to be enrolled in law school. Um, that, that college degree must come from an accredited a, US, a college or university accredited by the United States Department of Education. If you're graduating from an institution in the state of Utah, all of them are accredited, although I think George Weiss University is um, uh, on provisional accreditation, which still makes them eligible to apply, but provisional also means that they're not fully yet fully accredited. All the other schools in Utah, four-year institutions, are fully accredited. You do need to take this thing called the LSAT. It's an evil test, I'll admit that, but you do have to take it. Uh, and then you also have to register for this thing called the Credential Assembly Service Report. Uh, I'll get into details about that in a second. What about your bachelor's degree? Um, there is no requirement for specific coursework or specific major that you graduate with. That's part of the academic diversity that we're seeking to enroll students with. So any degree from any accredited school is going to qualify you for admissions and enrollment purposes. Um, but we are going to look closely at transcript. What is the challenging nature of that coursework? We understand some courses are more challenging than others. Majors are more challenging than others. School reputation, things like that. One of the things you want to pay close attention to is making sure you're taking classes where you're developing skills in written and spoken communication, reading and uh, comprehension, logical and analytical reasoning, two elements of the LSAT, and problem solving. Um, but you all have been through this process enough in the undergraduate admissions world to know that you know GPA does matter. Uh, and we're not going to um, uh, try to pretend that it doesn't. But I think it's very important that you don't focus on something like a GPA and trying to protect that special number at the expense of developing real skills. Because I think one of the greatest challenges students face in law school on occasion is somebody who's done a very good job of protecting their GPA by either taking the teachers who give the best grades most easily or not necessarily challenging themselves through the process. And while that may hold them in good stead from an admission standpoint into law school, once they get into class, there's no hiding from the work that you'll be facing, the challenging nature of the coursework. So granted, you'll want to maintain a high GPA as best you can, but don't do it at the expense of really developing academic skills in those areas. That's the bolts on the LSAT. Um, it's expensive, it's 190 bucks. Uh, if you want to become familiar with the test, that information is available on the Law School Admission Council's website. How many of you have been, have been to the website? I saw only three or four signed up for it. All right. How many of you are registered and have an account number? Okay, a good portion of you. So you've obviously have spent some time there. So get to know that website. I think it really is very helpful. And it is a site where there is official information that what you're seeing is going to be true and accurate based on what they're obligated to report, the relationship with the ABA, and the relationship with law schools. Uh, sample tests are available on that website as well as uh, they're available for purchase. The score range is 120 to 180 points. Um, the median, the national median is about 150 to 151. It slightly changes from year to year and test to test, but that's about the middle score. Um, it's now offered 
six times a year. It used to only be offered four times a year. So beginning with this admission cycle, you're going to be a part of a candidate pool for, that consists of people who, who will have the test available six times a year. I think that's in response to some of the schools that started accepting the GRE, and you can sit for the GRE whenever you want. Um, test dates that have passed it are the June and July test. The next one is next Saturday. Uh, there's going to be a test on the 17th of November, uh, then toward the end of January, and then at the very end of March. Those should all work for this admission cycle, although that March test date is really pushing it. Um, test, uh, those of you who observe Sabbath, there are Sabbath observation dates available. You can go to the LSAC website to see those. Just know that Sabbath dates aren't available for all the tests, so you may want to make some plans for that. Another big ch change that has occurred with your test group or the test group for this admission cycle is people can take the test as many times as they want. The LSAC used to have a provision that you couldn't take the test more than two times in any single testing year or three times within a two-year period, I believe. Um, and that was in part because Kaplan used to hire people to take the test and then they would try to memorize the questions and then take them back to the test centers and say, all right, let's see if we can reverse engineer this stuff. And LSAC was just kind of like, fine, do it. We'll, um, we'll just offer the test to everybody and whoever wants to pay 200 bucks a pop can take it for as many times as they want. Uh, so that's a big change there. It takes about three weeks for the test to be uh, distributed. You should know that you'll be getting your test score via email or accessing it through your account on LSAC about three days before we will have access to it. So if you start calling the school saying, hey, I got my score, is my file ready? I see my file hasn't been marked as ready. No, it takes a while for that nationwide upload to have it happen. So give us a couple of days to get that information. Um, finally, in terms of the testing, we are not a school that takes the GRE. Uh, we don't anticipate that, that happening for a while. Um, if you've been following this, you know that approximately 17 schools around the United States do take the GRE, that's 17 out of 202. Um, the, that, I think a number of the schools in the last six months who adopted that were anticipating a major shift in the ABA's position on uh, what they're going to require schools to do to meet the standards for accreditation. And what they thought they were going to do is just open it wide up and tell schools you can either use the LSAT or a different test or no test at all. Uh, that was the um, standard that was proposed to the council, and the council turned that down. They said, no, we don't like that. We, we think there should be a test, and we think there should be a test that is valid and reliable. So for those schools who have said they're taking the GRE, we're going to make sure that they have done a reliability and a correlation study on their students who have taken the GRE to determine whether it's a valid and reliable test. Uh, you may have read George Washington backed off of their GRE because they hadn't done that test, and we suspect some schools might be doing that also just because it's such a small pool of test takers. And uh, we continue to be one of the schools that believes, at this point, that the, the most valid and reliable test out there right now is the LSAT. Notice I didn't say perfect. Okay, we know there's issues with it, but in terms of the co correlation studies that have been done with the test and on our students in particular, we have confidence in it. The Credential Assembly Service Report. Um, it is a report that you subscribe to, um, and it's where all your transcripts will be sent to. You pay 195 bucks for them to collect your transcripts, your letters of recommendation, and then it's also the portal by which you will fill uh, in the very basic demographic information that all the schools will be asking of you. And then when you bring up an individual school's application, that information will already be populated. And then their unique questions will still need to be filled out by you, but it makes the process much more efficient. It's 195 bucks for the subscription, and then it's an additional $45 for each school that you choose to apply to. And on average, people are applying to six to seven schools. So that's what I meant when this application process, the five, next five years, include this year of application getting pretty expensive pretty quickly. And it's helpful to have a financial plan to look at how you're going to cover this. Uh, the cash report not only uh, distributes the transcripts to us, it also summarizes them, and I'll show you how that. It, it recalculates a cumulative GPA based on all the classes you've taken for, at all the institutions you've ever attended. So we have a cumulative that is calculated in the same way for all applicants nationwide. It's not absolutely objective, but it's more objective than just looking at a GPA that's on a transcript for various different schools. Um, they process your letters of evaluation. 
Know that that process can also get a little bit complicated because you have to select which letters you want to go to which schools. And sometimes that ca catches people by surprise if they only have three letter writers and they're going to assume that all three letter writers are going to go to all the schools they apply to and they just kind of start with that assumption and they don't recognize that each school you have to assign the letters to. That's because for some students they have a strategy about who they're going to have write letters to specific schools. If they have a school like ours that has a very strong reputation in environmental and natural resources law or bio law, they may have an, a person that they've worked with who practices in the field or is well known in the field that they want to write a letter just for that specific center of that program and then have another letter written by an alumni who uh, went to a school that they're applying to there, so either as a legacy, things like that. So you want to give yourself enough time to really understand the assignment process for letters of evaluation or recommendation that are going out through this service. And then it also distributes TOEFL scores. It does not distribute GREs. You have to have, if you're going to do the GRE and you're going to apply to schools that accept that, you have to have ETS and the GRE directly to the law school admission council for processing as a separate, or to the law schools as a separate processing piece. And you'll have to ask those law schools, uh, if you're going to be doing that, how they want that done. Question? No, I was using that as an, act, as, an, as an example. So schools are going to have different numbers. Some schools will say two and no more than two. And of the two, one has to be a dean's letter. Some schools will say, well, it'll take up to three and they can come from anybody. Any other questions? All right, transcripts. Um, the transcripts that you sent to the Credential Assembly Service uh, need to come from all schools you have ever attended, regardless of whether you've had credits earned at that institution, applied toward a degree at another institution. So you can't say, oh, I went to Slick right after, or I went to Slick concurrently enrolled while I was going to high school. I really blew it, I got an F. But I didn't transfer or try to transfer any of those credits when I went to Weber State. And I didn't even tell Weber State I went because it was a big mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Um, you can't do that. Yeah, in the law school application process, you have to have that concurrent enrollment transcript with that F sent in it, and it is treated the same way as that, that transcript coming from Weber State. So all transcripts from all institutions you've ever attended since graduating from high school, and if you did a concurrent enrollment in high school, you have to have that college's transcript also sent. Uh, foreign transcripts uh, sent uh, directly uh, to CAF if you attended school for at least for 12 months. If it's been less than 12 months, you don't need to do that. Also, if you attended a study abroad as part of a university, you don't have to have those foreign transcripts sent because that information will be contained at that university's um, study abroad kind of element or component in your transcript from whatever university you participated in. But if you went off to your own to Cuernavaca, Mexico to learn Spanish, and it was just it was completely independent, uh, and you were there for 12 months, you do have to have that transcript sent. Uh, and there's a translation service that is part of that CAS report that covers the expense of translating that, that transcript. But transcripts also, keep in mind, must always be sent directly from the college or university to be considered uh, official. This is the landing page for the Law School Admission Council. So if you haven't been there, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it, like I said, it's, I, I find it's some of the best information. And near the bottom, choosing a law school, searching for law schools. Uh, it's a small one. Uh, this is, I think, a really helpful one. And then thinking about law school can be very helpful. Also, along the lines of the LSAT, the um, um, Khan Academy has developed a LSAT prep course, which is free. Um, and so we've been, those of us who have worked in this field for a while are really excited about it because we feel that one of the things that candidates sometimes feel, and we sometimes notice, is the economic disadvantage that some candidates feel by not being able to afford to take, take a commercial prep course and their sense of disadvantage at having exposure to that assistance. And the Khan Academy, we hope, will really create a level playing field in that regard because they have developed a really robust test prep program. And for those of you who are concerned about cost, or even if you're not concerned about cost, I think it's a good, um, thought process to put yourself through 
in terms of starting with that. Um, it, it's, uh, they have a diagnostic test, which consists of questions of, from actual LSATs because they're working with the Law School Admission Council. That you can, you'll, it's kind of like doing the LSAC registration. You register, put in a lot of information about yourself. You do a diagnostic test. Then based on that diagnostic test, you can sign up for reminder emails so that it says it looks like you know, your weakest element is the logical reasoning section. So you know, we recommend you spend this much time per week on logical reasoning questions. And then it'll send you email reminders you know, in two weeks saying, look, we don't see that you've logged in to work on this section of the test regularly, so maybe you should start doing that. Um, so it's, 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 if you're an online learner, I think it's going to be terrific. If you're an in-person learner, you know, it might be that challenge that you may face if you've taken online classes and you don't, not, you don't like not having engagement uh, with another human being, so that's a decision to make. But the beauty of this is it's free. So you can start with this. If it's working for you, great. If not, then you can maybe consider some of the other more expensive routes. Okay, so half hour. I promised it'd only be about half hour. So this is the little break that I want to take for about five minutes. Um, if you didn't do the test prep registration, feel free to run out there. Um, we'll do, we won't do the drawing until we're completely done. We'll do it tomorrow morning when we pull the cards. And then let's start, reconvene and start again for, and go for an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes at uh, 10 after the hour, straight up. Uh, so at 6.10, let's meet back in here. There's soda, chips, and drinks over there, and I'm happy to answer any questions down here privately before we get started again.
All right, let's get uh, started for the last portion of the workshop. Um, so these are the, the four broad areas we're going to cover uh, for through the rest of the evening. Um, the first is touching on our new early decision program. We just instituted for this admission cycle. I've already talked with a couple of folks about this. And um, I'll give the timeline and the background behind it. Unfortunately, we did have to start somewhere. So for people who I've talked to, I apologize uh, for to them, to them in that their plan was if had they known about this, they would have taken the July test or the September test. But um, they didn't know about this. And um, while I do appreciate how that is a challenge from those who are ready to make this a first choice school, um, since this is the first year of the program, we are, you know, we have to stay with the early dates on this program to, to, to allow it to work the way it's designed to work. Um, and because, uh, just because there's going to be some seats offered in this early decision program, it's not like we're looking to fill 80% of our class with this. We anticipate uh, we'll probably be, if it's a good year, maybe 10% of our class will consist of people admitted through this. There's still going to, we still anticipate the vast majority of our class being filled by people going through the regular decision process. Um, in terms of the early decision process, it is driven based on a, a basic concept that the University of Utah's College of Law, the Quinney College of Law, is the candidate's first choice school by far. 
that if there's if you're struggling between which schools, if you were offered admission to two schools, you'd have a hard choice making, then this isn't the choice for you. Uh, this isn't the, the admissions process you should go through because this process is designed to encourage people who ha have certainty, as I keep stepping on that wire, have certainty in knowing that this is the school they want to be at. Um, and, and the easiest example I like to give people for thinking through this process is this. Um, it's one thing to say we're your first choice and uh, you'd love to come here, but it's another thing to say, all right, if these were your options, what would your choices be? So while we may be your first choice school, um, if you were admitted either without a scholarship or a limited scholarship to us as your first choice school, but you were admitted to your second choice school with a full ride scholarship, where would you likely go? Right? And if you'd say, yeah, I don't know where I'd go, well then I'd say then this isn't the program for you. Okay? This is, if, if it's like if you were admitted to your second choice school, you had a full ride, we're still the school you're going to, then this is the school. This is going to be the option, the best option for you. Okay? So that's what it's designed for. I want that out of the way. The reason for it is this. One is it's a binding application process. What does that mean? It means that um, you, by subject, submitting to this application process, you agree to limit your applications only to schools where you're going to be in the regular admissions process, at least while we're considering you, and not applying to any other schools that have binding admissions processes. You can't apply to us and George Washington at the same time as a binding applicant. Okay, and they have the same rule. Um, it's a commitment to enroll. When you fill out your application, and I'll show you where it shows this, um, you will find an agreement that says if you are admitted, are admitted through this program, you ahead of time are agreeing to enroll in our program. And if admitted, um, you will have 10 days once you receive notice of that admission of submitting your non-refundable seat deposit and orientation fee to evidence that intent to enroll. And those fees and, and that fee and, and seat deposit total uh, $1,100. Um, uh, so uh, the commitment to enroll and then you sign an agreement to that. That agreement, which is misspelled, I don't know why I didn't catch that on spell, <laughs> spell check, uh, also articulates our obligation to you in terms of as part of this process, you would be awarded, uh, there's two advantages. One is you're, you're given an expedited process. So you're, you, you need to have your file complete by October 19th. And then between October 19th and November 9th, we'll be reviewing the early decision pool as a group. We're gonna be looking at everybody in the pool. And then on November the 9th, we'll come out with our decisions. And for those people who we do admit, uh, you're obviously notified much earlier than but for going through this process. You are assured of a three-year renewable scholarship. And the only thing you need to do to keep that scholarship is maintain good academic standing, which is a 2.5 GPA, and not get into any student behavioral code problems. So in the application process, um, the way you identify yourself as an early decision candidate is when you go to fill out the information online, if you look at question three of the application status, is, is, are you applying for early decision? It gives you the deadline, and when you check that box, this is what opens up. And this informs you of a number of the things that I just talked about in terms of the binding nature of the application process, the fact that you'll need to assign the early decision agreement with the rest of your paperwork, and some of the other elements associated with going through this program. Uh, then you will, as, as you wrap up the, the application process, this page will also become available to you. And you click the PDF where you'll sign it and then upload it. And it's basically the agreement where you say you understand the binding nature of the application process, that if you're admitted, you're committed to enrolling, and that with that commitment to enroll, you know you'll be offered a scholarship, okay? Um, the early decision process evaluation. Candidates who go through this process are evaluated under the same criteria that all the candidates are uh, evaluated under either early decision or the regular admissions process, which I'll get into details in a few minutes. It also consists of the same reviewers, uh, the faculty, the nine other faculty and myself between now and November uh, or Ms. Moreno uh, following the 1st of November. 
Um, I will say, note that there is a difference between criteria and standards. We anticipate the standards to which these candidates who are admitted will be held, uh, they'll be held to a bit higher standard. To really be competitive as an early decision candidate, you'll probably need to be really close to or higher than both our medians for the class that was admitted this year, which was a 159 LSAT and 355 GPA. That's not written in stone, but that's, that's the expectation in terms of um, we're, you know, if we're going to commit to you and you're going to commit to us, there's going to be a little bit higher standard that you're going to be held to in this decision. But note in terms of the decisions that are being made, nobody will be denied out of the early decision process. Either you're admitted, and if you're not admitted, then you'll be rolled over or transmitted into the regular decision process. And if that's the decision of the committee, then you'll be informed, that will be the decision you get on November 9th, that uh, we elected to move your file over into the regular decision process. Because your file is complete at that point, you probably will hear from us fairly early in that process because you're going into that process with a complete file. Okay. All right, any questions about the new early decision process that we have here? Okay, so um, application deadlines for the regular decision process. So we opened up applications on Saturday, September 1st. We got three applications, killing it. Um, we really don't start seeing applications trickle in until closer to the end of September. I think a lot of things are going on in most candidates' minds in terms of starting school, getting ready for the LSAT. Um, the suggested file completion deadline is January 15th, and we call it suggested file completion for this reason. Everybody whose file is completed by January 1st, except for the early decision crew, is if you're admitted, you are assured of going through our first round scholarship review. That's the thing about the early decision process. We're not giving away all our money as part of that process. We still have, we'll have scholarships available to candidates uh, to compete for. And if your file is complete by January 15th, we're not gonna start making scholarship decisions until all the files who have finished review at that point with that group, all right? So that's the suggested date. And then file completion, you just need to have your file in and completed by March 10th to be considered timely in this process. Okay. File review, um, the file review order. Uh, this regular process will employ what I call a, a, an amended um, or modified version of the rolling admissions process. A traditional rolling admissions review is when a file becomes complete, it gets put in an electronic file folder in its order of completion. And then everybody who's completed it after that file is read after that file. So that's kind of the pro where we start the concept. But we also modify it by virtue of if you have a higher index score, we will move you to the front of the line uh, by virtue of that higher index score because the way things have played out in admissions these days is for those candidates that are seen as uh, competitive based on LSAT and GPA, other schools are gonna be competing for those candidates and we don't wanna be put to the back of the line in trying to recruit those candidates if they are admitted. So it's, it's rolling admissions with a modification of moving up high index candidates. Uh, so if you're looking at the blogs and reading top law schools or Reddit and saying, seeing people that are saying, look, I just submitted an application and I got admitted three weeks ago and then somebody else is saying, well, I was committed, I was, complete four weeks ago and I still haven't heard, that might be playing a little bit of a role in it. But it also might play, uh, be affected by the, the, the reading that's done on the file and I'll show you that in a moment. So that's the file review order. Uh, the admission committee members. Uh, the admission committee consists of eight faculty members and the leader of the admissions office. So that's, that's myself and then uh, Ms. Moreno through the meat of this admission seasons. We're all legally trained. I think it's important to keep in mind who your audience is and how you write something like a personal statement or send letters of recommendation may be affected by who reads your file. Some schools will have students, law students on the admissions committee. So you might wanna have a little bit of your personal statement uh, if you feel it's appropriate or it could be a good strategy, uh, addressing that, that peer and the perspective that that person may have. Some committees consist of just one person and it's just the admissions dean. And that's your audience and who you're convincing for admissions. 
Others will have professional readers, people who just read files you know, six months a year and that's just their job and that's all they do. Um, you can find that information out at that law fair that's going to be held here in October. Uh, ask the deans or the people who are behind the tables, they should have that information in regard to who's reviewing the files um, and who to talk to. Uh, it's important to know who they are also by virtue of that training. So for example, with us, uh, it's all faculty members and myself. We all have law degrees. We all work in the academy. What does that mean? That means we read and write for a living. So in terms of the quality of the writing in your application, Note that you know, we get distracted by typos, even when we have the misspellings made by ourselves. Um, so uh, by virtue of that legal training, we are um, not cynical, but skeptical readers. We're wondering if everything being told to us is accurate and true, and we're going to look for evidence to support what is being said in one document and other documents throughout the portfolio or that file. Uh, we're also impatient readers. So if somebody in their personal statement or letters of recommendation or resume seems to be just kind of droning on or giving information that really isn't relevant, we may get frustrated and wonder where are we going. And these are people who you want to have positive thoughts about you. So keep that in mind in terms of the patience of the reader. The voting process. Um, we have a majority vote out of three readers uh, in our process, although we have one category called a presumptive admit category. So based on LSAT and GPA and roughly about the top 10 to 12 percent of the pool last year as a measure, if that LSAT and GPA index, because we looked back at the data and saw that there's a high likelihood of admission, uh, we put these people into this presumptive category that says if one of the committee members votes yes, then that will have them identified as an admit but that vote can still be changed by the office leader. So our process is one where I read all the files. I don't vote on all of them because we try to, in terms of making sure that the impact of any individual committee member isn't overarching, that I only have one ninth of the votes because there's the total nine committee members. But I will read every file because of my role. And if I see that there's a file that I wonder about, sometimes I'll send it back to the original reviewers or ask for it to get a, a tiebreaker vote. So even with the presumptive admit categories, there's two committee members that are going to be reviewing that file uh, closely. Um, then in terms of all the other files, there will be teams of three assigned to each file. It's going to be a random distribution of who those teams of three will consist of. It's not always the same team members. The first two reviewers will read the file, and if there's two admit votes, the person's admitted. If there's two deny votes, the person's denied. If there's an admit vote and a deny vote, then it'll go on to that third team member for a tiebreaker. So at least in our process, you're not convincing nine people to admit you. You're, admit, you're, you're convincing a team, a majority of three reviewers to admit you on the decision. Um, uh, so, so be aware of that. In our voting process, there's another thing that's changing up this year. We're, we're allowing or we're, we're, um, we're implementing an interview process. So we won't grant interviews based on a request from a candidate. But the committee members re reviewing a file can request an interview. So we're creating a new status, I guess you might call it, uh, where um, if a committee member wants to have a candidate interviewed, we will extend an invitation to the candidate before that, that candidate is done with the review process and invite them to interview. Uh, and then they can either accept the invitation or decline it. Uh, and if they accept it, we'll interview it, take the notes, and incorporate that into the decision-making process. And if they choose not to, to accept the interview, then they'll just continue on with just the file review as part of that. Okay. Yes? The question is, is there anything that would prompt that request? Yes. No. Um, and, and it's a hard question to answer, and it really is one of those classic depends, because it could be that the academic record, and you'll see how we see that academic record, uh, the candidate may be making an argument for themselves or a letter writer might be making an argument on behalf of the candidate that says, look, this GPA as a cumulative GPA is fairly low for this candidate. But if you look at their last three semesters of work, 
this person has really stepped it up and they're performing at you know 3.9 GPA in some very challenging classes. So please, please pay attention and put more emphasis on that part of the academic record, more so than just this cumulative GPA or that earlier work. I feel it's justified. And a committee member might say, well, there's some interesting stuff here, but I don't know what they mean by justified. And I don't know which candidate we're going to get in law school. Is it the one who spent the first you know, three years or two and a half years not performing well because they were trying to figure out what they were doing academically? Or is it the person who has found focus? But I haven't read anything yet that suggests why they think law school is where they're focusing. So that's kind of a long-winded example of why a candidate, and I've done that for waitlist candidates, you know, where I've said, let's wait and interview this candidate, see if they'll accept an, uh, an invitation to interview so I can ask that question outright. Sometimes there's character and fitness questions where there's a character and fitness issue that's come up and we just want to get a sense of you know, looking this person literally in the eye and seeing how they answer our questions about what happened, what led to it, and is this something that we shouldn't be concerned about. Sometimes it's about having a conversation with them. We've had issues where people have overcome some, some, some challenges in life, including either substance or alcohol abuse. And while we feel in terms of reading the record they may be prepared, we want to get a sense of them realizing are there triggers that are going to occur in law school or in the practice of law that may kind of tempt them back into this and what kind of support do they have around them. So just wanting to have that conversation more so than just an interview. So those are the kinds of things that may prompt an invitation to interview and a whole bunch more. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So voting process, committee members, admission statuses, fairly simple. Admit through this process, admit wait list or deny. People will be denied as part of this process. We know what admit means, we know what deny means. Uh, wait list, what does that mean? Um, that is basically our fine tuning knob that we know based on a lot of data, we've been around for 106 years, what we can anticipate on average is saying if we have a pool, this year our pool was almost 800 candidates. If we have 800 candidates and we extend offers to 325 of them, we can anticipate a yield rate of between 35 and 40 percent. Now is it going to be closer to 35 or 40 percent because that can make the difference of 15 people and when we want a law school class of about 100, uh, 15 people on either side of that can make a difference, a really big difference in terms of the culture of the school. So the wait list consists of a group of people who um, they've demonstrated to us that they have the capability of completing our programs and we can have confidence in that, but basically we're just waiting to see if there's going to be room for them based on when people submit their seat deposits and, com and commit to enrolling. And it's going to be interesting because now we're going to have, as I anticipated uh, telling you uh, with the early decision process, about 10% of the class locked in. So we might actually be working with a slightly smaller wait list this year because we know we can really, really count on 10% right out of the shoots of who's coming in if we know that going into to, to November. If we have less than that, then you know, we might have to go with a little bit larger wait list group. But that's the wait list. And all wait list candidates are given the option of interviewing. We don't have to invite them. By virtue of being invited to be on the wait list, that includes an automatic invitation to, to interview. And in terms of the interview, one more thing. Um, while we prefer them face-to-face, -face, we are willing to have them either on FaceTime or on Skype. So if somebody's out of town or can't make it, we can, we can do that. Uh, notification, how are you notified? Um, officially, I have to say you're notified on paper. You will either get a letter in the packet that says you've been admitted or a letter saying you've been waitlisted with some explanation of how it works and a letter or a letter saying that unfortunately the decision is to deny. Um, but one of the funnest parts of my job is calling people and letting them know they've been admitted. So I try really, really hard to call people once the decision is made. Um, in addition to it being a fun part of my job, I know you guys are just waiting. And um, we are a school that doesn't do things electronically. We don't do batches of emails. We've seen some schools screw that up so bad that we don't want to say, oh, sorry, we didn't mean to send that email. Um, so we have this process where we're always checking and double checking the letters that are going out. Uh, but I do call and it's fun. Uh, if you see a number from the University of Utah, uh, it's probably not me because I make the calls from my cell phone. Um, and sometimes when I do call from my phone office, I have a question. It's not all. I will call people sometimes with questions. So sometimes people have sounded really disappointed. They're like, oh, I thought you, this was the admission call. 
Like, no, we have a question. Um, but it's okay if you don't hang up and listen to the voice message and then call me back to make sure I'm not a marketer. I, 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 my feelings aren't hurt. Okay. Uh, so those are, that's the notification process. Now the criteria. Remember I talked about the criteria and said it's different from standards? So we have over, uh, the, 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 the process is based on three questions and we have approximately 40 criteria under which you will be evaluated with. In evaluating those criteria, we use them to answer these three very broad questions. The first is, have you demonstrated that you have the academic skill set necessary to compete in and complete a program of our quality? All right? We're one of the leading schools in the country. Secondly, how well have you demonstrated that academic skill set relative to the pool that you're competing with? So the larger the pool, the more challenging it is to gain admission into our school, and the smaller pool, uh, the, the, the less challenging it is. That's why um, you guys are in an interesting era right now in the law school application process. If you were sitting in front of me three years ago, you would really be in the driver's seat because the national and our local pool had diminished significantly. We hit a high watermark in about 2010 of almost 100,000 applicants to law school nationally to fill about 50,000 seats. So law schools were driving that bus. Um, but since the Great Recession, law school applications have dropped by over half. And so it created opportunities for candidates to gain admissions to schools that they would not have otherwise gained admissions to based on just the statistics, the economy of seats out there. Um, but the interesting thing that you guys are facing right now is the economy seems to be coming back. The last parts of the economy to come back was the legal market. So, it was, so we've been slow to come back. But we've seen the percentage of the job employment rate going up. We've seen salaries going up. The white shoe firms in New York and Chicago and LA are now paying 180, 190,000 to start. There's one from Cravath, I think, last year started 200,000 a year. Um, it's a lot of work. You can take that job. Um, but there's signs that this is this is starting to heat up from the standpoint of applicants. And so, two years ago, our applicant pool grew by 8%. And the applicant pool in this year's class grew by 15%. Uh, the data is suggesting that there's not, and, and that was against the 9% national applicant pool raise. So two years ago, the national applicant pool was still flat. We were up 8%. This year, the national pool went up 9, 8%, and we were at 15 The data is showing that maybe it's going to be another 2 or 3%. We're not going to see a big uptick, but we anticipate some more rises in the national pool, and we expect some here also. So it may get more competitive for you guys. Just, just realize that. And that would have an effect on where you get admitted uh, and scholarships uh, if, if, it, if, it's a mag if it's a pretty significant magnitude change. That I don't, I don't see a huge magnitude change, but there's always that possibility. All right. So I already told you the two questions. Skill set, relative measure of the skill set, who you're competing with. The third question is, um, what more are you bringing to the law school by virtue of your life experience, background, and interests that's going to enhance the community that you're going to be a part of for the next three years that you're a student with us and the potential impact that you have on the community at large as an officer of the court and an alum of our program? Really broad questions, right? And these are the, th this is how we define academic skill set here in, in these six broad categories. Intellectual thinking, you know, are you a good thinker, right? right? You do, it's really hard to demonstrate a strong academic skill set without being smart, right? Um, but there's lots of smart people out there who don't employ good academic skills, right? So know that. So that's a starting point, but then there's more. You know, there's those personal qualities, highly motivated, empathetic, practical judgment, common sense, um, integrity and honesty, your ability to communicate. That's your job as an attorney. Your tool chest is just this box full of words, right? And the grammar that, that you use with them, and that's, you know, you read and write and talk as a lawyer. So communication is hugely important. Task management, uh, your ability to, to organize tasks, organize people, get things done. Um, and then working with others. Um, and that plays out with us in two ways. One is the job of a lawyer really does entail needing to work with others, whether it's co-counsel or arguably opposing counsel. You have to work with those people. If you have a motion that you want an extension on something, you're going to have to work with opposing counsel on that. Right? So it's not just the people you're sitting with, but it can be the people that's sitting across the table from you. So those kinds of things that we're looking for. 
um, in terms of that skill set and how you demonstrate them. This isn't just a list that we kind of came up with. This was actually a list that was developed over about a five-year period where the Law School Admission Council engaged in a national study and surveying professors and students and, and, and breaking these down. So there's some legitimacy behind how we're looking at you as measured against the skill set. Now, this skill set question is layered over the criteria under which you're going to be evaluated by us. And the criteria includes, under the academic factors, LSAT and GPA. Yes. Um, they're important, but they're not going to be sole determinators. And in fact, we have a policy that says that explicitly. No candidate is to be admitted or denied express, uh, um, based solely on the LSAT score, GPA, or index. It is only after a full review of the entire file by voting members of the committee that a candidate's decision will be determined. So in looking at those academic factors, we're going to be looking at you know, advanced work, other degrees, the major, the difficulty of the coursework that you engaged in, grade trends, dominant language, uh, the academic or educational history of your family or your own, test scores, uh, other responsibilities that were affecting your performance while in school and how they related to the schoolwork that you were doing, uh, leadership and extracurricular activities. We know the data shows that um, disproportionately uh, leaders and communities do come from law training. That, that whether you're looking at legislators or school boards or nonprofit boards, things like that, there's, there's very regularly a number of attorneys who have the skills based on task management, intellect, and understanding of laws and regulations and drafting. Um, they, the community benefits from that. We like to see people who are already engaging in leadership before coming to law school. And then demographic and diversity factors. There's always the hot button issues and the things that people assume will drive that part. And sure, they're listed near the top in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, social orientation. But there's a whole host of other ones uh, that also overlap some of these criteria or that, that people are in, uh, overlap with. Because for example, family education history is also tied to demographic information because you're talking about socioeconomic status and other areas. It's a fairly long list here. And as we devised it, my hope as you look at it, you recognize that there's going to be a bunch that you could check a little check mark next to and say, yeah, I, I've got something to contribute in these ways. And there's going to be some that's like, that doesn't apply to me. And that's intentional. We don't want this list to be kind of the ideal candidate checks all of them because it would really be impossible for it. But rather, something for you to think about and what we think about as we're putting together a class of 100 to 110 students who will largely be learning from each other um, in the law school experience. And, and as we look through these, it's your job in answering these three very broad questions to take us beyond the numbers. Because sometimes what I hear from candidates is, it's really frustrating. I look at um, your data or I talk to schools and it just seems it's this LSAT GPA thing, this median thing, and if you're above the median, you're good to go. If you're below it, you might as well forget it. Um, and it's like, you know, I'm so much more, but why are you making the decisions on me based on the numbers? And my response is this, that if you, if you present yourself in that way, then that's all you're leaving us to. That if you don't give us context for what this LSAT means in our evaluation of you, or what's the story behind this GPA, then all we're left to use is that LSAT and GPA. So one of the things you want to do with the contents of your application file is paint that portrait in the most positive way about you for us to get that read about you. Okay, and, there's, and that's why we ask for so many things, but we do have those basics, right? There's the application form where we're, we do ask the question about socioeconomic status and family educational history. And if you are a first generation college uh, graduate, what was the educational attainment of your parents and your grandparents? And then we give you examples of what we feel disadvantaged socioeconomic background is. Were you a ward of the court? Was your family on uh, AFDC or, or WIC? Or did you have, were you a free, a free lunch or a reduced lunch recipient at any time during school? Things like that. Also, you know, the question of uh, how did you find out about the law school or what leadership developments did you have and ask you to talk about that in your resume or list those kinds of things out. So that, you know, we get some of that information in the form but the form has these blanks where you articulate what that answer is for you, not, not to just check a box, okay? 
Uh, application fee. You should have gotten an application fee waiver when you checked in. Okay, you good? All right. Um, resume. Uh, some schools are really picky about resumes and say no more than one page and lots of white space. And it's like, all right. I like information. The thing is, I want you to use the resume strategically, though. That, that yes, there's going to be stuff on the resume that are going to be mentioned in the application form and maybe mentioned in the personal statement. But it's that, that bullet piece that lets me kind of get a broad picture of you over a more extended period of time. So um, I am one of those people that I'm fine with a three-page resume if it's relevant and, and well put together. Um, uh, some schools are not. So get permission if a school says a resume no more than one page. Don't go to that school and say, Dean Aguilar said I can send you three pages. No, Dean Aguilar said he's okay with a three-page resume, but follow the instructions. There's a question. Yeah. yeah. And that surprises me because that's traditional on a resume. It's just basically where do you put it? You know, do you put it in the first section or do you start with education and then experience and employment? I don't know. So I, you'll need to ask the school that. And that might be one of those things either at the law fair or you start having an email conversation with somebody at the school that you may have read on your resume, this is what we suggest. And you just acknowledging, it looks like you're not suggesting employment history. Is that true? And they may find, that, like, no, we didn't mean that. We, the assumption is you'll include employment, but this is what we also want more of. Um, well, yeah, our instructions say submitted a resume with going back at least five years. That includes educational, employment, honors and awards, things like that. So part of this is the test for you. Uh, th three pages is a cool thing, but, but if you're 22 years old, um, you didn't work in college, I'm going to have a different expectation of what your resume is going to look like than somebody who has a PhD and is 45 years old and has been working in a think tank for the last four years, right? So it's very much context oriented, right? Okay, um, but along those lines, um, if you are a recent college grad and you're graduating early, so uh, the earliest, the youngest applicant I've ever had in my pool is 17 years old. Every year I always get a few 19 years old, and these are people who finished high school with a bunch of AP credit and finished college in two years. Um, Going back to this idea that they're going to have a different resume than somebody who's been working for a while, uh, I think sometimes for that younger candidate, our expectation is that you've, your, your work has been as a student. That's basically been your job. So if you were delivering pizzas and stuff like that, that's fine. But that's how you're going to be measured, and your GPA and that transcript are going to play a pretty big role in the decision we make about you because that's what you've been doing. Also related to that is we're going to try and see how you fit in with our school because we have an average age of students of a little over 27 years old. Um, so we're about four years older than the national average. And along with that, even with our younger students, we're trying to get a sense of how mature is somebody. And so for the younger students, I often see kind of like high school accolades, you know, captain of the football team, football team won state championships, president of senior class in high school. Don't do that. It's just, uh, we're looking at your college stuff. When you're reaching for high school stuff, it looks like you're just kind of living in your past. So you don't want to do that. We want go only go back as far as college for those kinds of things. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that's just basics there, at least on the resume. Any questions on the resume? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you want, um, and if it provides some context, so for me, for example, um, I know college athletes in terms of task management and time availability are sometimes more challenged than students who don't, especially if they're a Division I athlete in a premier sport. So if you're playing Division I football or swimming or basketball or, or softball, I know the time amount dedicated to that may have had an impact 
on GPA or grades in terms of that performance. And so by listing that on a resume, but not necessarily talking about it in a personal statement, I can put two and two together in terms of saying the academic record may have been affected by this. And, and if they were, you know, academic all conference and did some of these other things, there's this other benefit that, that, that carries. But if they've been in the workforce for 15 years, I'm fine with that just being on the resume and being in the workforce, doing whatever you've been doing professionally is, is kind of the core of that other information is fine. Does that answer your question? All right. Any others? Okay. Um, before letters of recommendation and personal statement, I want to jump to the CAS report because by describing what we see about you can be really helpful in how I make suggestions in approaching the personal statement and CAS report. So this is the law school report that you pay $45 per school for us to see. And it, it's just a one-page document that has attached to it the writing sample uh, when you've done with the LSAT and you have that last section where your hands hurt and you still got to write. Um, and then all your transcripts are uh, stapled to it and then your letters of recommendation. So there's a lot of information here. Larry Selden um, from Henry Street, New York, New York, is a pretty incredible guy. Any, anything that can happen to anybody in the law school admissions process happened to Lucky Larry. All right, so because there's a lot of information on that one page, I broke it down into two so it's easier for you to see and for me to describe. So just on this one page, um, the kinds of things that would catch my eye as I review a file uh, real quickly include stuff like this just background. God, this seems, come on, where are you? There you go. Um, previous name, Bart. State of residence, New York, age, a little bit older candidate, mechanical engineering was his undergraduate degree. So for example, Bart is a previous name. I see that regularly with women candidates, their maiden name, right? But sometimes I'm going to wonder, you know, why is there a name change? That I'm going to have questions about that, because remember, I'm a skeptical reader. But, but, well, why is that there? And if there's not an answer, I'm going to be like, well, why is there not an answer? Um, the state of residence, we're state school. Where the state of Utah, where the taxpayers of Utah help supplement the tuition costs here. So we seek to enroll the student body that consists of about 70 to 75 percent residents of the state of Utah. And applicants know that. It's a bit of a red herring, and I'll get to that if you guys want me to. But nevertheless, people have a sense of that being important. And so sometimes I'll see on an application form that somebody claims to be a Utah resident. But when I look at this, that they filled out three months before they filled out the form, they say they're a permanent resident of someplace else. You know, why is that? I don't know. Remember that skills and that honesty and integrity stuff part of it? I have a question. There could be a really logical reason for it. Maybe they're an officer at Hill Air Force Base, and all the people in the military know that wherever you're stationed, even if you're a permanent resident from wherever home is, you are considered a resident of that state upon arrival. Uh, for purposes of tuition and things like that. So it could be a really logical reason as I read the, the, the background of this candidate, but that's going to catch my eye, right? And then that mechanical engineering thing. I know that's a hard science. I know that there's uh, less grade inflation in the hard sciences than there has been in the social, uh, social sciences and humanities. So that'll give me a perspective on how to read that GPA real quick. Um, institutions attended. So this is where he earned his Bachelor's of Science, Hobart, in Mechanical Engineering, but he also has a Master's. We like people with graduate degrees. Other departments in our graduate world have taken a risk on this candidate, and he completed it. So we know that that's a good sign in the academic skills development that somebody was able to complete a Master's or a PhD in another field. So that's, that's, that's a benefit. But that's a long list of schools up there. you know. Um, so we are a three-year program, and we like to see everybody who started finish with us. We have a very low attrition rate. It's less than 5%. It's one of the best in the country. So we like to know, have a sense that people are going to stick it out with us, not go kind of visit or transfer elsewhere, things like that. So he might have some explaining to do. And here again, it might be very logical. Maybe he started off in the military as an enlisted person and then worked his way through the military education system and earned a graduate degree. And you know, all of this could be very commendable and be an answer that is in his favor. But I don't know. But I'm going to have an eye out for the, that explanation. Um, 
This is information that people pay for. Where are we? There we go. Um, and that subscription cost. This section where it says code notes from transcript, these code numbers match the code number. So 2294 is Hobart. He graduated 47 out of over top 10% of his class there, so he had rankers. This school, 2777, has an unacknowledged transcript. So what, remember I said earlier that you have to send all the transcripts from all the schools that you've ever attended since graduating school? So there's people in Newtown, Pennsylvania, where the Law School Admission Council is located, whose job it is to know transcripts. That's what they do. They go day by day through all transcripts. And they look at the notes on the transcripts. And if there's a question on a transcript sometimes that indicates the student attended another school but didn't report it when they filled out their information on the Law School Admission Council CAST report, then they're thinking is there's a transcript out there that this person hasn't acknowledged. And we have evidence that it came from this school. So technically that makes this file incomplete because not all schools are indicated in it. And then for us who get this, we know that this person is not reporting all schools. So usually when that happens, you'll get a call from us saying, we've got an unacknowledged transcript. Uh, first of all, get it there. And then secondly, send us the second statement why you didn't include it originally. Okay, so notice that. Uh, academic action means he got in trouble for something, plagiarism, some, who knows. Um, term action, that's kind of a behavioral code issue there. Uh, and then financial obligation. That means that school was reported as a school that he attended and was gonna have a transcript sent, but the school refused to release the transcript because he owed them money. So pay your parking tickets, okay? So just, you know, that's a lot of information just in that little section, right? So we got a lot of information on you. We know more about you than your parents, okay? You laugh, we do. <laughs> um, uh, there we go, this section, where are you? Up. There we go, school degree. So this information pertains only to Hobart College. We can't possibly know everything about every college or university in the United States. I've been doing this work for all, almost 28 years. Um, and there's over 3,000 colleges and universities and junior colleges in the United States. I don't by any means claim to know anything about all of them. And I know a little bit about quite a few of them. But what that section does is it lets us know based on the last three years of data, where are we, there we go, uh, for the people who graduated from that school, of all the people, this many had scored at the 95th percentile and up, this many scored at the 90th, 94th. And so if it's just your average school, the distribution of those numbers will sh create a bell-shaped curve, right? For schools like Harvard and Standard, it's skewed way to the high end, high 90s times. Schools like University of Phoenix, it's gonna be on the lower end just kind of the way the, the, their graduates perform on the LSAT, generally speaking. And then in the next section where it says per, this percentage distributions of GPAs of those candidates over the last three years, how many have GPAs in those little sections? So we can get a sense of whether that school had a lot of grade inflation or not, right? And where it gets challenging is if a school has the LSAT skewed to the lower end of the scale, but the GPA skewed to the higher end of the scale. You know, that's disparate information. It's telling us that the students do really well academically because they all got really good grades, but in a high stakes standardized test, they didn't do so well generally. So that gives us kind of pause when we're evaluating a school that has that kind of difference in front of us. Most schools are gonna be kind of in the middle. Yes. Just undergrad. It's the first undergraduate degree, so it's only Hobart. So if he had earned another bachelor's in civil engineering from a different institution, that different institution, even though he earned a bachelor's, wouldn't be in that calculation. Okay. So this section is reviewing of the transcript year by year. So we can see what school he was enrolled in. Uh, we can see how many semester hours during this period he was enrolled in. We can see the GPA for that term, the cumulative GPA at that school that he earned the percentile rank that he performed in that school, the college mean, what is the average GPA at that school during that time period for the people who have registered for CAS, and then the literal bottom line, the cumulative GPA as it's calculated year by year. So that's where we can see the grade trends vacillating, going up, going down, staying flat. Uh, so we'll have that all, all that information there. 
So if somebody on my application form indicates that we ask how many hours a week did you work while you're in school, and they say, you know, 30 hours a week, and then on this application form for the school year 92-93, uh, I saw that they took 24 credits. You know, they're taking 12 credits an hour and they're working 30 hours a week. And this person was busy, right? You know, it kind of comes. Now, if a person's taking 24 credits and they didn't have a job, you know, what would the expectation be there in terms of if school was their job, that's all they had to do, how should they be doing? Right, so this is the information that we layer on top of uh, other information as we evaluate a candidate. This section tells us um, how many A's he got during this term period, how many B's, how many F's, how many unconverted, how many basically classes that they just took pass fail, things like that. So we can see if somebody, we can get a sense basically on that section that somebody's padding their GPA with, with, with courses or not taking classes for a grade but pass fail. Then the bottom section, this is where um, the GPA information gets to us. So our policy on, I'm sorry, the LSAT information gets to us. Our policy on multiple LSATs is uh, we will presume to go with the highest LSAT score for people who have taken the test multiple times, but we will leave it to the prerogative of the reviewer to go with the highest LSAT or the average based on their best judgment. So what does that mean? It means you know, 90, 95% of the times we'll go with the highest LSAT score. But there is this small percentage where people will say, especially when there's many tests, the data that we get shows that the more a person takes the LSAT, you know, three or more times I would say, um, the more accurate prediction is made for the performance in law school based on the average LSAT score because there's more data to draw on in terms of highs, lows, and everything in the middle. So for us, if my general recommendation to the committee is based on the research that I've read is if you've got a candidate who's taken the LSAT more than three times, um, we tend to find that based on our correlation studies that predicting first year performance is more accurate based on the average than just the high LSAT score. So that's something to think about. And that's national information. So other schools have this information too, right? And then we can do that because they tell us all the information. So a school doesn't tell LSAC, our policy is to only go with the high LSAT score, so only show us the high LSAT score. Now they see it all. And I think the distribution of scholarships and stuff like that can be affected by the number of times that a person takes the LSAT and how that average plays out. And, and even though they may have the highest LSAT of the applicant pool, there's other scores present that suggest that, you know, there's a better prediction based on the average, then that, that may affect, at least on our end, some of the scholarship offers. Okay. Uh, undergraduate summary. This is the one that um, you need to pay attention to here. This is the degree summary GPA. So that's the degree he got at Hobart Undergraduate School. That was the GPA he got at that school. And then the GPA for all the schools he attended, for all the undergraduate classes he took, that's the cumulative. And so those two uh, numbers know this. The cumulative is based on all classes taken for all, uh, all, all grades earned for all classes taken at all institutions attended. The degree summary is for all classes taken at that school. So if you've repeated classes, and this is true, I think, of all Utah schools. I, don't, I haven't found a school in Utah that doesn't do this. Uh, schools in Utah have a policy that if you take a, a, a class multiple times, in computing the institutional GPA, they will just use the score you earned the last time you took the class. So if you took chemistry in your freshman year and you got an F, and then you took it in your junior year and you got an A, the U will use the A to calculate your GPA, and you'll have a higher GPA. But when it goes through this, this CAS report process, they're going to look at the F and the A and use that for the calculation. Conversely, if at the U you got an A, an a the first time you decided, or a, a B the first time you decided to try it again to get the A and you end up getting a D, they're going to use the D in your GPA calculation because they used it the last time you took the class. Right? That's, that's their policy. So these numbers may be different than what's on your transcript. We know that. Um, you should be aware of it too because sometimes we see arguments made on the academic record a candidate may have saying, well, the law school at Mission Council is wrong in their calculation because I have a higher GPA. If you look on my transcript, it's X. 
And we'll say, while well, you're right, the transcript on your GPA is X, the LSAC isn't wrong because they told you when you signed up for this stuff how they were going to calculate the GPA. So don't argue with how it's done. You were informed with it. Okay? That tells us if you've ever enrolled in another school or if you've ever engaged in misconduct in the application process. Question here, then there. It would more likely fall in the spring, that, that, that most schools will, will incorporate the academic year to the summer. Like here at the University of Utah, when they do the calendar, it's fall through summer, and then the next academic year begins with fall through summer. Okay. All right. So with all of that, letters of recommendation and personal statements, what are you going to do? Right. So by knowing the three questions that we're going to ask of you, my first suggestion is looking at letters of recommendation. Um, it matters who writes them, but you need to help them write the letter. And when I say it matters who writes them, I'm not talking from a political sense. I'm talking from a, a knowledge about you sense. That these should be people who can answer those questions that we're asking of you and be able to give us the answers with a, this is one of the strongest people I've ever had in school because. So you guys are here on a Tuesday night after a holiday, and you're going to find you know, you're, you're working at this. You're not going to have a problem doing this. But I think what's important is how you ask somebody to write a letter of recommendation. So if you're going to go to a professor, catch them in the hall without people around them, or go to their office and say, I'm applying to law school next year, and I need excellent letters of recommendation. I was wondering if you would write an excellent letter of recommendation for me. That puts them on notice what you're doing why you're asking and the quality of, of, of the recommendation you're seeking. And you're going to find people who are going to be really happy to do that for you. Although I will give you kind of the, the law professor's easy out. Or I shouldn't say, well, law professors use it all the time. Professor's easy out. If you get a professor who says, do you really think I'm the best person to write, for, uh, write a letter for you? That's their way of saying you're not going to get the letter that you want from me. Okay, so move on. You'll find somebody. You guys will find somebody. When that person or people, those people say, yes, they will write the letter, then say, great, um, I'd like to meet with you for 45 minutes. To that meeting, take, uh, uh, be prepared to talk about why you want to go to law school, the list of law schools that you're applying to, and briefly why you're choosing each school to apply to, um, uh, a copy of this law school report if it's ready, uh, and if not, then kind of your, your end transcript and uh, I think it's helpful if you know what you're performing on the LSAT is, your performance is before you ask, but it's not imperative. Um, and then let them know with, about you, warts and all. Oh, and your resume, so you have a little bit of the background. Because by telling them why you want to go to law school, the schools that are going to be getting these letters, because remember you, when you use that service, they don't have to know what schools are getting these letters. They just send this to the service, right? Uh, it makes it easier for them. They don't have to say, dear each school. They just send one letter to whom it may concern. Um, but by sitting down and having that conversation with a the person, they're going to be able to better craft a new paragraph or a different letter than what's reserved in their word processing files. Because they all are, if it's a professor, they have a word processing file where they just fill in the blank. And they're happy to write letters of recommendation because it takes them two minutes. You don't want them to spend two minutes on this. Um, and so by letting them know all this stuff, including warts and all, or submitting your writing to them that you did and got that A, they can refer back and use descriptions for us that they wouldn't be using normally. Because the greatest mistake I tend to see in, in the application process are with letters and with personal statements, and it's what I call the mistake of neutrality. The information contained in those documents are neutral in effect because it's not new information. So the most common letters of recommendation we get are from people who identify the candidate by name, then say that they as a professor are from whatever school in whatever department and they're notorious for being a tough grader, um, the classes you took from them and the grades you got in the classes and the, rec and the fact that they're recommending you for law school. We know what school you went to because we have your transcripts. We know what, tra what, grade what classes you took because we have your transcripts. We know what grades you got because you have your transcripts. And we were presuming that you asked these people to write letters of recommendation with the hope that they would recommend you. 
So that, 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 that does nothing for us. We're looking for more fill in the blank. The other thing that sometimes challenges candidates, I think, is if there's a blemish on the record that really catches our eye, and there's these glowing letters, but in the back of our mind, uh, we're wondering if this person who's writing the letters knows, knew everything we knew about this candidate, would they write the same letter? And it's those letters that say, look, I know this candidate's score is X on the LSAT, or I know this person had a, a, a criminal history background at this part of their life, but I'm still writing this very strong letter of recommendation because I've spent time with them, and I think even with this knowledge, they would be a great attorney because, right? And that kind of letter will carry a lot more credibility because they are writing to us from a fully informed position. Okay, so that's my suggestions for letters. So um, personal statements. I can't tell you what to include in your personal statements. Like I said, I can tell you how we're going to evaluate you. But in terms of the contents of your application, um, question. Um, thank you for asking that question because there was a version of it up here. We, re we require one letter. We will take up to three. If you're a recent college graduate, two or two, at least two out of those three should come from academic sources. Um, in terms of what schools do with letters, it's up to them. But for us, we only require one, and it goes back to that idea that the average age of our students is older. We have a lot of people who come from the workforce, and in tough economies especially, it's kind of tough to go to your job and say, I know we're talking about this promotion or this you know, increase in salary, I hope, but I'm not going to be here next year because I'm applying to law school. Um, so we don't want to put a, a tremendous onus on somebody who can't, who's been out of school for 15 years, right? So we only require one. But if you've been in school, and I define recently as in within the last two years, then I do expect at least one or two letters from academic sources. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm two years out of school, so that's helpful. Okay. Perfect. Does that answer your question too? Yeah. All right, back here. I think that depends on the strategy you're employing. And I'm going to use kind of an easy example for me um, and how you kind of segue it into kind of a different kind of strategy is going to be kind of your own thought process. So the easy example for me is, let's say I got a candidate who's well below our medians. And so I've talked about, and I was going to talk about this in a second, but let's talk numbers real quick. So our median LSAT last year for those who, are, who enrolled was 159, median GPA is 355. The 25th to 75th percentile, that middle 50% of the class, uh, the GPA was uh, 332 to 375. And the LSAT was 157 to 161. And then the absolute range, remember I told you we look at everything? The absolute range for the LSAT was 145 to 174, and the GPA was 2.3 to like 4.15. So I do want to acknowledge that 2.13 is not the 145, okay? But quite frankly, I'm, you know, it probably makes some of my faculty mad when I say this, but I don't care. I'm proud of our low numbers to the extent that when we say we look at everything, we do look at everything. And you know, just because you have a low number doesn't mean you have no shot. We know there's more to a candidate than a few three-digit numbers. But if you're below those numbers, you're going to have to, you're going to have a hard time, and you have a task in front of you to show us that relative to the pool, you've got an academic skill set that's going to position you to uh, compete in and complete our program, right? And then what more are you bringing? You know that question. So with that statistical background, let's say I have a candidate who's below the medians, not, you know, not scary below, but below the medians. But this person has been doing social work, wants to go into juvenile justice issues, maybe wants to go or, and says specifically, would like to work for the guardian ad litem. These are all things that we as a committee know uh, are areas where attorneys are really desperately needed. And we also know that these are areas of work where there's a tremendous amount of turnover because of the emotional toll that is taken on attorneys. But these are difficult situations. Now, if I have a candidate 
who maybe has a master's in social work or has been doing social type work in her, his or her position and now wants to, instead of assisting with the kids in some ways, represent them as their lawyer in a proceeding as a guardian ad litem. They know that that's going to be difficult work, that a lot of that work is often going to be involved with the termination of parental rights and bad situations. But the likelihood of this person, based on his or her professional experience, really going back to do that work is much higher, in my opinion, and experience than somebody who's fresh out of college, hasn't had that life experience, and while they have the, the best of intentions in saying they want to do that, haven't been exposed to it. So that's the kind of person who has the actual experience, that has the, the commitment to the work, that if they strategize using letters of recommendation to show that, you know, the, the community service leader that they were involved with in whatever, but children's issues, and their employer, their supervisor, who wasn't a, pro, wasn't a professor, but someone who supervised their work and working with the kids and can support a very difficult story, saying like, this person's the real deal, that's a strategy that the person has to, to think about employing as opposed to just faculty. Okay? So that's where it goes to what knowledge do they have of you and how does that link to the strategy that you're applying with. Okay. Answer your question? All right. Any others? Okay. Personal statement. Um, we don't have any page limitations. Most personal statements are about two pages long. Even if you are young and don't have much life experience, I'm going to have a hard time being convinced of admitting you if it's less than two pages. I want to know something about you. All right. Um, but if you've been in the workforce and you can't get it less than four pages or five pages, if it's all interesting, that's okay. Right? Schools that have really high volumes of applicants, like Georgetown or George Washington with you know, 7,000, uh, Berkeley with 5,000 applications a year, just to get through the applications, they have to be strict on the page limitations. So when they say two, they mean two. And you're, you know, if you give them three, it's just not going to be read, and they're going to be annoyed with you. All right, so read the instructions. But with us, you have full leeway. The good news there is you can tell us your story. The bad news is you can kind of trip yourself up with giving us too much information or not enough information, right? So you've got to use good judgment. But as um, you think about it, look at everything else that I've talked about that we're going to have in front of us. Put all that stuff in front of you, your transcripts, your law school report, your resume, your filled out application form. And that thought process that you're taking to the letter writer about why do I want to go to law school? Why am I choosing to apply to this law school? And then answering the three questions, academic skills and other things you're bringing to the law school. What does all this say about me in answering that stuff? And then what context can you give us in that personal statement that will fill out that portrait that you're, you're painting about yourself so that we're really positive about it? And so to that end, because we're impatient readers, know that um, you need to be making a point. So have a theme, a, a point, a whatever you want to call it. You know, just there, there needs to be a point you're heading, and then write three, four, five, six drafts. Once you're done with those drafts, pass it around to two or three people. One of those people needs to write well, so they can read it with an eye towards grammar and punctuation and tone and formality and all of that. The other person needs to know you really well, or other two people need to know you really well. Don't tell them what you want us to get out of it, or what you're trying to say, or what your theme is. Just say, this is my law school personal statement. Please read it, and I'll come back and talk to you after you're done. When you sit down and talk to them, say, what did you get out of it? And if it's what you want us to get out of it, you're on track, right? Um, we're not, you know, it's not, that, that part's not rocket science. But if it's not what you want us to get out of it, um, let them know what you were hoping to say, and then maybe they can help you. The person who's writing or is a professor may be able to help you in your current life, um, but not long term. But that person who knows you really well, the spouse, the cousin you grew up with, the sibling, that kind of person, they may be able to say, here's an anecdote that you remember when, right? And that can better tell the story. Uh, and then also ask them if anything about you was left out in that personal statement. I think there's a lot of attributes that we carry that we sometimes forget it's a part of who we are, whether it's empathy or a work ethic or a sense of humor. And ask them if that was left out. And if it was, just say, you know, what do you think, you know, can you give me an idea or suggestion about how I could 
work that into it. And you may find that that's already on your resume. So you're golden, right? You're good there because there's other parts that'll cover that. But that's my suggestion in, in approaches because I can't tell you what to say because I don't know any of you. So, and that's, that's the big part of this personal statement is me getting to know you, okay? Um, and then I got some websites. So those websites can be helpful, I think, in terms of especially public service stuff, financial aid. We got the financial aid discussion next week. Um, so please try to make that. Any questions? And like I said, if you're on our list, if you registered or if you signed in, we'll send you these slides as, as, as a PDF. A global JD program, right. Um, no, you can apply for need-based scholarship. We just don't have any merit scholarships for the program. Okay. You can apply for, we have um, what are called graduate assistantships. So like the, the third year student who was out there working as a graduate assistant, you're eligible to apply for those jobs in your second year. We don't give those jobs to students in their first year of law school, regardless of whether they're global JD or entering JD. But the second year, they can get some of that support. Um, but yeah, we don't have any merit scholarships. We will consider them, if they're receiving federal financial aid, uh, we will consider them for need-based scholarships. Any other questions? Was this a little bit helpful? All right. Go forth and kill the LSAT. Thanks for coming tonight, guys. The raffle, oh, I told them the winner would get the email in the morning. Because, yeah, so for if, if you came late and you didn't fill out the application for the um, free LSAT, you can still fill that out. But don't stuff the ballot box, because they'll spam you with email. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. 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 Thank you